Child sexual abuse is by far the most taboo, least understood and quite possibly the most persistent problem that we have been facing in the Cayman Islands. Contrary to what some people may believe, it's not something that's new and it's not something that is totally imported. We have some pretty deep historical ties to this issue, which is part of the reason why it makes it so uncomfortable to talk about it. Having grown up in Cayman, it was something that we heard about possibly as children. We, we just heard, you know, oh well, something happened to that little girl. And we, we didn't know what that something was, and we kind of just uh, brushed it off because we really and truly didn't know anything about child sexual abuse. I think what has happened in Cayman is that we have swept topics such as this under the rug, and you know, it, it became more of a, a family centered thing oh, that's their issue. Um, it's not a community-wide issue, that's just how they are. It's most definitely a problem in the Cayman Islands and I think the, uh, the numbers that we collect as a Department of Education Services are testament only to that, that um, you know, at my school last year, for example, at Clifton Hunter, um, we had 27 cases. And when you couple that with um, the other government schools, and also those numbers that the Department of Children and Family Services also collect, which may be over and above those that we find within education. This is one of the most unreported things to, or issues to, uh, to affect our community. Then you realize that the statistics are gonna be a lot higher than what is readily available. Everyone knows it exists, but they don't understand the extent to which it, it does exist and it creates a, um, a, a, a cycle, pretty much, as a result. Child sex abuse is a sensitive subject that many victims choose to keep to themselves, but one woman says more help should be available for victims and their perpetrators. Human 27's Monica Walton has more. Margaret Branch has decided to put pen to paper and relive her childhood traumas in a book. It makes you sick. It messes with your self-esteem. In it, she recalls growing up with sexual abuse. It doesn't let the person that you are, it doesn't bring out the true identity of who you are. A woman molested as a child speaks out tonight about naming and shaming online. A local activist launches an online petition to prevent convicted criminals for, and especially convicted sex offenders from working at schools. All right, we're going to turn now to the courts where a 27-year-old man denies 16 counts of sexual abuse against his stepdaughter. A 32-year-old man is given a two-year suspended sentence for having sexual intercourse with a 13-year-old girl. Sexual abuse of children is one of the social issues that needs more attention. 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 To give this social issue more attention, we first ask, what is child sexual abuse? Child sexual abuse is any sexual act between an adult and a child, or any sexual act between two minors, one exerting power over the other. Any behaviors that are of a sexual nature that are for the benefit or for the pleasure of that other person, then it becomes child sexual abuse. Um, child sexual abuse, when we talked about touching and non-touching behaviors, we want to remember that things like voyeurism, um, looking at a child for your own sexual excitement, exhibitionism, you know, displaying private body parts because you find that exciting and pleasurable to a child. Those things also are considered um, abusive, even though they don't involve any touching. And then under touching, we have the penetrative acts and the non-penetrative acts. So a lot of the times in the community, persons might feel, you know, sexual intercourse did not happen or anal intercourse or there was no oral intercourse and therefore, it's not abuse that the child, you know, got a little groping or there was a little fondling and, and that's okay, but it's not okay. So the touching, the non-touching, the penetrative versus the non-penetrative, all of those acts are considered abusive sexually for children. Well, I'm a firm believer in saying that sexual abuse is in every community. And the problem is, is that with smaller communities, it, be, it can be even more of a problem, but less talked about. It's out of control and people don't realize it's actually there. You know, so it's, it's, it's like this, this thing that festers underneath this subculture that no one even realizes exists and, and it in some ways 
um, greatly affects and determines the outcome of the, the culture at large. Why do you hear so little about it? When it happens, um, there's a culture of silence, and that's not germane to Cayman, but um, it's one of the problems that we deal with when we're looking at this. There's a lot of shame associated with it for the victim, and that ought not to be so, but that's just kind of um, how the cookie is crumbled with respect to this particular issue. So that culture of secrecy, and um, here in Cayman, that is not helped by the smallness of the country. Um, the fact that we pretty much know everyone, or we've seen pretty much everyone, or if we've never seen them, they're related to someone that we know, or a friend of someone we know. And that helps um, maintain that culture of silence, which is um, a huge, huge problem, um, not only for the victim, but for the country as a whole. Okay, man, is is very hard to come forward because, you know, as it said, you sneeze in East End and West Bay says, God bless you. And so I think that it's it's scary. It's very scary. So Cayman Bracken, even Little Cayman, is not uh, exempt from that at all. I'd say that it is quite an issue. I've dealt with cases over there. Um, and one of the things that you find in small communities like the Brack is that there's such limitations as far as resources that are available and as well it's it's more difficult to sort of separate yourself from the situations as far as avoiding certain places or perpetrator or any of those it's you're more scrutinized in a smaller community and so it makes it way more difficult for a, a child or the parent or adult to uh, to break that silence we provide services in Cayman Brack um, in the past, there was a counselor that was housed there full time, and individuals in Cayman Brack were not accessing the services. Is that to say that it's not needed? No, I think there is a even bigger sti stigma to work with in Cayman Brack and uh, possibly in Little Cayman in terms of, of reaching out and getting help. Uh, they're very weary of individuals, especially if, we, if they come from the main island. They're very weary of who they are and what are their real uh, motives behind helping us. And uh, they don't really understand us. And so a lot of that comes through. And then the sad reality is that sometimes because we're so understaffed, we have the same counselor working with a perpetrator of abuse and then the victim may be waiting out in the in the waiting room without realizing it let's take a look at cayman's history in the context of child abuse We talk about having a matriarchal society in the past, but I really don't think that we had a matriarchal society in the true sense because women didn't have control of all different aspects of society, whether it was politics, um, business, um, education, whatever. We had a matrifocal society, but not a, a true matriarchal society. We have men who went off to sea for extended periods of time, and the women um, who were left here essentially had to step up and take on roles that were traditionally held by men in order to ensure the smooth running of their families, of the community, and of the country as a whole. And that is a, a tremendous thing and something that we need to acknowledge, but that's normally where we end the conversation. We don't often discuss the fact that we had traditional gender roles um, that were very near and dear to our hearts that were challenged by that very reality of having men leave and having women take on um, jobs that were held by men or positions and duties that were normally held by men. So men have maybe been on ships for very long periods of time. They come back and they maybe are accorded almost like king-like status. Um, and in that, where you have persons who might be prone towards perpetration, something like that would make it even more difficult than normal um, to express those concerns because on the one hand, you're so happy to have your male folk back. And on the other hand, there may be things that are happening that are not um, appropriate, but yet you don't want to ruin this time of celebration. And when you pair that with the shame that's just associated with abuse, that creates a dynamic that is very, very difficult um, on your own standing as an individual to address without the necessary resources to do so. 
and this is where for those men who are already prone to perpetration this is where we're seeing the focus then shift to the children in the home the female children and the male children and that's where we're seeing some of the roots of the problem it's almost an inheritance so to speak I've, I've only been a social worker for, for a number of years for about four years and in that short time I was dealing with clients from various different age groups, and in each one of those age categories, there was some level of exposure to sexual abuse. I'm dealing with my adolescent clients, and I'm speaking with the parents who are in their um, 40s, let's say. They are telling me stories of what happened to them when they were a child, how they were abused by, by uncles, how they were abused by, 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 by their own parents or, um, or family friends. You know, so it's 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 not fair to say that it's something that's imported. I know that that some of that would exist based on the the the, the high transit um, po population that we have here. However, it is so deeply rooted in our history that that would be a very inaccurate statement. The unfortunate situation is that is it was usually a family member, and so either they felt too ashamed to tell anybody because of fear of what that would bring to the family, or when they did tell someone, that person decided to not believe them or to sweep it under the carpet and pretend as if it wasn't happening for fear of what the repercussions would be in coming forward. If the male children were themselves being sexually abused, they then begin to witness the abuse of, of sisters, cousins. Um, you know, and nieces and the other, other young women in the home. And in that, there's we've already sort of um, established a sense of normalcy as far as the behavior and expectation that this is just the way that, that things are within the family setting. And that's a very dangerous precedent to set. What I've noticed is that um, you, you would have a family where it, it happens and say there's, there's let's, let's, let's focus on female sexual, child sexual abuse. Let's say there's a father who's molesting the daughter in the home. The, the sons, they see this, they know what's happening. They start to think it's normal. They may either grow up to molest their children or molest other children, or they may begin to molest the victim in the home. I've actually seen cases where that has been the situation. Let's get one thing straight, K-Man. A child cannot, 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 cannot seduce an adult. I don't care how she walks, talks, or acts. If she's not 18, she is a child. I am a child. And your husband, brother, boyfriend, baby daddy, pastor, grandfather, minister, boss, police officer, gardener, uncle, father, should have known better. There's only one child in that scenario, and he isn't it. Understanding the impact of gender roles and traditional values on sex crimes. It's important to note that research has been done um, in relation to gender uh, roles and traditional values in relation to sex crimes. More than 100 reports in the scientific and professional literature involving more than 35,000 subjects indicate that rapists, child molesters, incestuous parents, and sexually motivated murderers are typically very conservative in their sexual and social values and sometimes more religious than average, suggesting that in many cases traditional sexual morality is a contributing factor in sexual abuse rather than a deterrent. At the first international conference on the treatment of sex offenders in 1989, there was a broad agreement that Western societies with repressive sexual attitudes and traditional male-female roles are more likely to have high rates of all forms of sex crimes. When you look at that and you take um, the aspect of the research and how do you apply that to K-Man, um, we obviously do live in a conservative society, um, very high um, rates of uh, religious morality um, here. And how does that affect our boys and girls? Basically, um, girls are traditionally socialized to um, obey you know, authority, not to speak up. Um, children are to be seen and not heard is often a message that um, we hear, we heard of growing up as children. And so when girls are basically socialized to not speak up and use their voice, they become vulnerable to child sexual abuse. Um, often, um, as well, we should say that girls are often valued for the way they look, um, you know, how their body looks and things like like that, we socialize our girls to have value um, placed on their bodies, and so that also makes them vulnerable um, to exploitation as well. For a long time, there was 
a really disturbing trend um, in which men in their 20s, 30s, and 40s used to take their lunch breaks at around 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And they used to go by the high schools and the fast food places, which is in the same quarter mile stretch. And that's where they used to try to pick up new teenage girlfriends. Um, this was also done for gang initiation. And, you know, it was the norm for a long period of time and it took quite a, a lot of um, advocacy and and you know trying to to raise this as an issue um, but you, you still see not as not as much as before but you still see every now and then you know um, the, the, the odd odd person out who is clearly not there to, to, to pick up a son or a daughter I think a common thing amongst Caribbean culture which is it, it came and has taken that on is the acceptance of under, of minors with older persons, the tolerance, I should say. Now, everyone knows it's wrong, but when they see it, they smirk at it, but nothing is really done because they tolerate it to a certain degree. So you'll have a 23-year-old guy who's picking up a 13-year-old girl from school, and even though everyone knows it's wrong, no one is saying anything about it because it's always happening, so they just ignore it. As a nation, we have this tendency to try to differentiate ourselves from things that are happening in the wider Caribbean. And for whatever reason, we, we somehow want to, to establish that things are different in Cayman. And that's not always the case. So there's a, a, a trend, for instance, where there are men, fathers, who believe that it is their right to be the ones who initiate their daughters into sex. Um, and that is something that we see in the wider Caribbean, but that we're also seeing here in Cayman. And it's important for us to acknowledge that because we keep trying to separate ourselves and distance ourselves from the issue in so many ways when there are the realities that are happening in the region that are also happening right here at home. child will come and disclose, make a report, um, is not believed and there are many reasons but two main ones for the mother choosing not to believe her daughter, um, one of which is financial. So let's say for the sake of argument, this lady, um, uh, the, the alleged perpetrator is the major breadwinner or the sole breadwinner in the home. So the mother, in some cases, will choose not to believe her daughter because she's very fearful about what will happen to the whole family. So that's one reason. And we have a growing concern all of the, well, most of the councillors share this concern too, that in more and more cases, the mother is a foreign national and she wants to get her seven years in so that she can become Kimanian, have her papers. So there's a tendency not to believe the daughter for that reason as well. And that, that's, that's growing. Jailbait is better than not fishing. Anything after 12? is lunch. It's grass on the field, time to play ball. If she ready to bleed, she ready to breed. I could teach her a thing or two. You've heard it. Maybe you've even said it. Or maybe you just laugh it off. But if you don't say it's wrong, you make it okay. It's not okay for grown men to flirt with young girls. It's really not okay to take a lunch break at 3 p.m. To go by the high school or fast food places. To pick up a new girlfriend. It's not okay to think that even if she might be too young, nothing not gonna happen because this is Cayman. It's not okay to turn our children into fair prey for men's sexual advances. If she's underage, she's a child. This is no joke. Stand up and be a man. Standing idly and silently by is no longer an option. How does Cayman's modern culture affect a child's vulnerability to sexual abuse? Cayman is not immune to the keeping up with the Joneses mentality and what we're finding is that as we as a community, as a society, we're becoming increasingly more materialistic. Um, and what this is translating into, especially now that the divide between the haves and the have-nots is, is growing, is that um, we're, we're finding that young people are, specifically young women, um, are getting into relationships with older men um, in order to be able to gain access to having some of these things. So whether it is um, the latest cell phone or 
or you know new clothes or ride in a new car um, these are things that that we're seeing them them trade sex for on um, the flip side of that we're also seeing where families um, you know sometimes single family homes who are struggling um, and you have a parent or parents who are encouraging again young women to get into these relationships with older men because um, that older men then becomes a provider to that family so paying a light bill um, paying a telephone bill um, or giving that child lunch money or spending money and um, you know this this is encouraged as as a way to sort of keep the family afloat um, we won't call it what it is we won't call it commercial sex work we won't call it um, uh, uh, sexual exploitation of children but that is in fact what is taking place Hey you! Hey sweetie, how was school? It was good, it was a little bit boring. How was work? Oh, it was good. Oh yeah? Can boys be victims? As a community, we haven't come to terms with the broad spectrum of sexuality and sexual orientation. And what we fail to understand is the fact that our homophobic tendencies put our young men at an increased risk for child sexual abuse. We have very different messages that we send to young men and young women. With our young women, we're very clear as far as, you know, don't have sex until marriage, be pure, be virginal. Um, with our young men, on the other hand, we, we tell them to spread their seeds far and wide with as many women as they possibly can because we tend to think that this will somehow keep them from becoming homosexual. And the dynamics of se sexuality don't work that way. Um, in regards to boys, I would say that because we often don't think of boys as victims, they become um, often the unheard victims because they become afraid to speak out um, because boys aren't considered victims oftentimes in sexual abuse cases. And often there's the stigma of homosexuality when it comes to boys. If the male is a perpetrator, they don't want to be considered or labeled a homosexual. Um, another area of vulnerability, and I would think that this would more go um, with our boys, even though I'm not deluded enough to think that our girls are not involved in gang activity as well, is the drug culture that exists. And again, this is not germane to Cayman, but it does exist in Cayman. And where we have broken families or we have families that um, children don't particularly feel a part of, um, the way gangs are set up is it does create a sense of family. It creates a sense of belonging that all children, all people need. So that becomes very attractive. And of course, the force of threat for leaving this family um, also keeps them there. But what about the initiations that happen? What do those involve? And I've had, um, I've had occasion to work on a case where a young boy was sexually assaulted by another male. And that was an older, um, an older child, it was not an adult. But again, we talk about sexual abuse not just being with, with, with adults, but with older, more powerful children. And that child was um, forced to have anal intercourse and um, that child would have been part of the wider gang and really was not interested in having a conversation with anyone external about what he had suffered. But again, having great concern about whether or not this meant that he was gay or he was homosexual. And that is another aspect of culture where um, the whole idea of what does it mean if there's a same-sex attraction. So for boys who may be being um, targeted by older men who are of that persuasion, they're not wanting to talk about it. They don't even want therapy, far less to go to the police to report it, because they do not wish to be associated with anything that smacks of being gay or smacks of homosexuality. And that right there opens up a really huge vulnerability for our boys. Um, if indeed something is happening or if indeed they are being targeted, they're not reaching out for help. Even with young adolescents, males, they are 
it does exist where they, they are, their first sexual experience may be with an, with an older woman. And people don't realize how often that does happen. However, in um, our society, it's seen as a high five. It's a, it's, a, it's a badge of honor. I was with an older woman. And so it's something that you, you gloat about, not something that people look at as, oh, well, that shouldn't be happening. Someone's taking advantage of that boy. No, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's an award, pretty much, to be able to do that. So you walk around with your head held high. And as such, the females who would be inclined to that are also led to believe it's okay for me to do this because no one is going to say anything. You will quicker, even though it's, it's hush hush in our society, you will quicker find where a male perpetrator would quickly would much quicker receive a consequence than a female perpetrator. Being in the Caribbean, where men are told to, you know, buck up and be be a man, and to not show any type of um, any type of emotion and all these different things. If it does happen to a young man, chances are he will be ridiculed if he says anything about it. Where to a certain extent, there is um, a level of compassion when it's a young girl, um, you know. So I, I do think that yes, there is that misconception in our society as well. So essentially, what we've done is that we have laid a seed that a man, a true heterosexual man, can never ever refuse sex with a woman. A man can never be raped by a woman. That a real man will never turn down a woman sexually, and that is incredibly confusing for a boy because the, a, a child is not equipped to handle sex at that age, and the, the repercussions of that, the damage that is done, isn't limited solely to that experience. However many times it happens, it's not limited solely to that victim. And even our language betrays us. We talk about young men, boys, being initiated into sex by an older woman. And we never ever talk about the fact that that older woman raped that boy. We talk about it as initiation. What are some of the signs of child sexual abuse? Well, if a child was sexually abused and it was not reported or never dealt with, um, some of the effects you may see is that you might see pregnancy in a, in a young lady. You may see an increase in um, criminal behavior. Again, you might see aggression. And they may not overall be productive in the community. The situation is that when the first sexual encounter that someone has is one that is either forced or there's some sort of shame attached to it, uh, some individuals may adopt a, a perspective of sexuality where it's very detached from any sort of emotion. So they can become sexually promiscuous or um, at times may decide that um, having a baby is something that they would like to do because of the fact that having a baby will provide them with unconditional love. Uh, they have a baby for themselves so that someone will love them because a lot of times they feel that they're not worthy of love or, or the people around them have expressed that in some way because of their actions. And so they, they will, you know, they'll do those sorts of things. They'll also get into drugs or, um, you know, abuse, different substances, they might even join gangs or even or criminal groupings as people call them uh, because of the fact that there is that, that element of shame, the element of unworthiness, so they're, they're easy targets for other things. I think in, in, in from the victim's perspective, there's always a sense that there's something not right. Now, they don't always have the emotional or mental capacity to, to, to process what is happening, so they don't fully understand. I think as they grow older, they start to think, maybe I deserve this, and I don't, this, this, this should have happened to me, and they take responsibility for it, which they should never do. And in some cases, they, um, they may submit and succumb to it, and then they will carry that on into their life as well. So when they're looking for relationships with other persons, unfortunately, they don't feel a relationship is the way it should be unless it, it involves some of that, those unhealthy behaviors, those unhealthy habits. 
and in such, they in turn may grow up to ignore when that happens to their children, or in the case of, of the, um, someone growing up to becoming an abuser themselves. When you're trying to establish a healthy relationship as an adult, those things are going to come up and it's going to be much harder because um, you're less willing to be vulnerable with your partner because the last time or in previous occasions when you have been vulnerable, you were taken advantage of. And so you have a lot of trust issues. You can be very jealous, you know, and your partner may not understand where is this coming from. I've never shown you anything otherwise. Why are you acting this way? And then little by little they start to realize. And, and then sometimes they may ruin relationships because of that. They may have had a possibility of a healthy relationship, but because of all this other stuff that they haven't dealt with, it's just really hard for them to move forward and to be able to truly be intimate with someone. And not, not just intimate physically, but intimate on a much deeper level in terms of sharing their thoughts, their feelings, their dreams. What is the impact of child sexual abuse on someone? The impact, the ripples of child sexual abuse go so far and wide that it's mind-boggling, really. Um, when we look at something like HIV and AIDS in the global pandemic, what we have found is that young people whose first sexual experience was forced are at an increased risk for contracting HIV, not only at the time of the rape, but also later on in life, because they grow up to make poor choices, such as having unprotected sex, having sex with multiple partners, and even selling sex. Because of the fact that there is that, that element of shame, the element of unworthiness, so they're, they're easy targets for other things. And so when we get them through the door, they may be coming to us because, you know, sometimes they're coming to us because they can't find employment, they can't hold a job. And then little by little, you know, we always say, you know, what's the root of, an, of that problem? Why is it? You know, you seem like a competent individual. What is it that's keeping you from that? And once you start to dig a little deeper, you start to discover certain things and um, maybe their mannerisms or even uh, some of them engage in cutting or eating disorders. And so all of a sudden you start to unveil those things and finally, when you build that trust with that client, they come forward and they say, well, this is actually what's happened. And now it's sort of spilling out everywhere because when things aren't dealt with, um, that's what happens. It catches up with you. How important is it to use the right language when speaking about child sexual abuse? Language is incredibly important because it's essentially how we process information and it becomes knowledge that then hopefully dictates the way in which we act. Which is why, while it may sound like semantics or splitting hairs, it's important to understand the differentiation between a pedophile and a perpetrator of sexual abuse on children. Why? Well, pedophilia is a mental disorder. And when we think of pedophiles, we tend to think very specifically of someone who falls outside of our familial home. We think of someone who might be a loner with sort of these uncontrollable sexual urges. We might even think of someone who is different to the point where others in the community can recognize that difference. Um, what that does is that as, makes us associate pedophilia and pedophiles with this stranger danger. In reality, what we've seen is that 90% of child sexual abuse victims know their perpetrators. 30% of them being family members and the remaining 60% are people that the family actually trusts. The term pedophile, um, I think, has been used interchangeably with other types of meaning. We have persons whose sexual interest is for children, okay? They're not interested in being intimate with an adult. They're interested in children. And that's different from someone who is just interested in sex across the board and is pretty much willing to have it with whomever, okay? Um, when we talk about pedophilia, we're talking about persons whose sexual interest is for children and their the sexual interest for an adult or interest in being in an adult relationship is absolutely not there. So we, we want to make those distinctions between someone whose sexual interest is only for children, um, someone whose sexual interest is specifically for pre-adolescent or pre-pubescent children versus pubescent children, and then people who more or less take advantage of quote-unquote opportunity and are equally happy, for lack of a better word, 
um, to be sexually intimate with a child versus someone else. So there's some there's something I think um, exciting for them about conquering, as as you would say, or introducing this child to the world of sex, because then you can be tailored to suit my particular. Um, fancies where it concerns sex but I think the word pedophile has just been used you know um, you've been accused of child sexual abuse you're a pedophile and that's not necessarily so Professor Liz Kelly of the Child and Women Abuse Studies Unit um, over in the UK talks about the dangerous dichotomy of this notion of the pedophile versus the ordinary man the dichotomy of pedophile versus ordinary men is a dangerous one Ordinary men are the ones abusing children. Generally, these men do not only have a sexual attraction to children. These men have wives and partners and girlfriends and maintain successful sexual relationships with adults as well as abusing children. Using the clinical definition of pedophile, that of these men only having a sexual interest in children, stops us looking at strategies of abusers. These strategies are the same regardless of whether the abuser fits the clinical definition. Abusers choose the children they abuse and they make a deliberate attempt not to get caught. They make strategic decisions in order to facilitate abuse. The pedophile discourse prevents us from discussing this and also helps the abusers avoid responsibility. Describing men who sexually abuse children in this way focuses on their deviance, an abnormality, a sickness. It stops us looking at men's entitlement, the notions of ownership, and we lose the option to talk about choice and responsibility for our own abusive actions. If pedophilia is thought of in these terms, we become distracted away from the real issue, which is actually one of ordinariness. Abusing others is a choice, as is not abusing others. If we use terms that allow abusers to say, I can't help myself, what does that say about the likelihood of preventing child sexual abuse? Child sexual abusers describe themselves as such. Using terms preferred by abusers means we collude by using their language. We must challenge the notions of ownership, sexuality, especially that of men, and ensure that choice and agency of abusers is acknowledged and discussed. Othering them into pedos or sickos prevents that. Let us call them what they are. Sexual abusers of children. Who are the perpetrators of child sexual abuse? I wish I could describe exactly what a perpetrator looks like, but I can't because a perpetrator can be anyone. Um, unfortunately, it can be a friend, it can be a very a, a family member, it could be a sibling at times, it could be a parents. You don't know what a perpetrator can look like. Perpetrators are normal looking people with jobs, um, with good jobs sometimes. Um, perpetrators can be people with no job. A perpetrator can be a male or female. A perpetrator can be an old adult, meaning, you know, 17 over if you're talking about senior citizens. They can be young, they can be 17, 16, 15, 14 years old. So there's no like prototype for that. Um, but the one thing you will find is that in a situation where the perpetration is happening time after time, it's someone we trust. It's someone that we have given access to our children. necessarily know to be able to point out a perpetrator in a crowd, right? These are the people that come to your house, a family friend, um, does activities with the children and things like that. So they're not the monster that we might have, you know, that we might have in our head that every perpetrator is this horrible person. That's not what you see. You see a person who grooms and makes makes plans, but I think it's a little bit of both. Well, grooming is a is an action that on the part of the perpetrator to sort of prepare and, and break down the uh, the victim's defense mechanisms to get them to trust them a little bit more to get the parents to trust uh, the perpetrator more so that they'll have more access to the child. They are not strangers to the family. A lot of times, grooming behavior can be equated to let's say a, a con artist. Um, 
they it doesn't happen overnight they'll find a child that is vulnerable because uh, perhaps their parents are not around very much or um, they don't have a very close relationship with their parents um, they don't have a lot of friends at times and so that makes them more prime because when they, once they have a lot of friends you can some of the friends might start to throw their two cents in as to what's going on or why are you hanging out so much with this grown-up they'll be really great at finding out what their interests are and um, all of a sudden this person is very interested a lot of child sexual abuse victims will tell you I can't remember exactly when it started to happen because it was just little by little by little and this relationship is so strong in other areas that it's it's sort of a price that they pay to have this strong connection with someone that they've always wanted to have. And the same thing can go for parents. Parents may, you know, um, unfortunately single parents, they really struggle. So when someone steps in and says, I'm willing to help you out, you really take advantage of that and see them as a godsend. And so again, they, they take advantage of that opportunity that this person is really struggling. So they're gonna have full access to this child. A lot of times when you're a victim, you think you're the only one that this has happened to. And you know, as long as you keep your child away from a perpetrator, then you'll be fine. But you don't realize that that perpetrator is actually um, looking at other children as well. And that's about grooming as well. Like they're, with the grooming behavior, it's about finding the easiest target, the most accessible target. Accessibility in our country is, is an issue. I think children are more accessible for different reasons. One, we're, we're, we're very trusting. We're a very trusting society, so we are. We don't. We're not always aware and vigilant as to what is happening in regards to the children, because we just believe everyone's okay, and that also has a lot to do with the fact that there is no real awareness to what's happening. So people don't know, and they leave their children to their own devices, or in some situations, they they're negligent. I'm a Bye, Mom. Remember I'm staying the night at Leslie's? Okay, I'm leaving my house right now. I'm so pumped. Okay, so what are you wearing? I love that dress. I've heard of um, stories where uh, perpetrators um, of child sexual abuse have been in the same room with the parent and uh, maybe the child comes to sit on the lap and the parent can't even see what's happening or doesn't realize what's happening. Uh, they're that overt about it, but um, they can be sneaky in their own way. And again, it's because that trust is so strong that parents have their guard down and children have their guard down that it, it opens it up to that. I've seen families where it, it, is, it, is, it is prevalent within the family itself. Numerous family members are engaged in it. Numerous family members have suffered under it and everyone knows what's happening, but they will go as far as to grab their children and close the door and lock themselves away when they know what's happening and pretend it's not happening. And, and, and this, this attitude towards it has created a sense where the, the perpetrator feels empowered because he knows they know, but nothing is being done. And then at the same time, the victim is being further victimized because they're not allowed to, to have a voice because they also know that those people know and have turned their back and have shut the door on it. And so they feel like there is nothing that can be done. And at the end of the day, they have to go through it. And so no one is willing to speak about it because from in the home, you are taught, don't mention it. What it takes to protect our children. What I've seen a lot of is adult survivors coming forward after so many years of silence that haven't been able to express what has happened to them. And it's almost this generational shame 
that has happened and that's kind of kept child sexual abuse through this sort of a secret issue within our community and all the these adult survivors are coming forward and talking about what has happened to them so many years ago and not wanting children in the community to go through it. I think as parents we have a well we obviously have a responsibility if we know that there or if we suspect that there is um, a chance of this you know a, a, a sexual abuse happening um, we need to pull our children away from those situations. I believe that we cannot address a problem unless we acknowledge that there is a problem. Because one thing I will say about perpetrators is they're looking for compliance. They're looking for a compliant child who has hardly any voice, who lacks confidence, who doesn't even know the difference between a penis and a nose because no one's bothered to explain that to them. Empowering our children with knowledge, having those conversations with our children the same way we tell them that when you're crossing the road, you look left, you look right, we need to tell them these are your private body parts. And if anyone tries to touch them, to look at them, um, talk about them in a way that makes you uncomfortable, or they try to make you do that to them, mom wants to know, dad wants to know, and it's not about being in trouble, it's about these are our safety rules, this is our safety plan. Culturally, um, we often do our children a disservice by um, things like not basically ensuring that they know that their body is theirs and they have a right to speak out. For instance, we push our children to go and kiss, you know, Aunt Flo or you know, Uncle Joe, and if they don't want to, um, we still continue to make them um, do that. And to me, that's sending a message of saying you don't have control over your body. We need to get comfortable with sex and comfortable with talking to our children about sex from a very early age. A lot of parents ask us, how early can we start to talk to our kids about sex? And I think it should be as soon as they can start talking. <laughs> I've had someone call my cell phone, ask for someone that was not me, after I indicated that um, you've had, you have the wrong number, try to actually engage me in conversation. And I let it happen because I was curious to see where was this gonna go? Well, it, it turned into, oh, well, you're not Mary? What is your name? And, and where do you live? And they literally would have had a conversation if I had continued and if I had given information. So, the whole cell phone phenomena that exists here is something that really does need to be thought about in a very serious way, not just for our girls, but for our boys as well. Um, the fact that almost every single young person has a, a cell phone, and it's legitimized by the fact that after the hurricane, um, that was how communication was done. In many homes, there still are no landlines. Um, we can get internet service without having a landline, and that is something that becomes hard to regulate. So children have phones and they don't have basic phones, they have smartphones. So they have access to the internet, they have access to calling friends even though mom and dad might have sent them to their room or they might be under punishment. They still have that connection with the outer world. We are a, um, a wealthier society, so every kid has a cell phone, every kid has a laptop or an iPad, and we need to realize that it's not necessarily as glorified as it seems on if you're watching television like, like, like Law and Order, how this person goes out and there's this calculated, it's not necessarily that calculated and that glamorous. However, you do have persons out there, like on Facebook for instance, who are, or they come across someone's profile, it's a 13 year old girl and they start talking to her. Now, there's unsupervised access to these websites, to these, to these, to the cell phones, BBM, whatever the case may be, and there's regular contact there. And now because they're, they, they aren't being um, watched as close as they should be, they can just go to the cinema and meet up with somebody. We have to teach them just like we teach them everything else. Uh, we teach them to put on their seatbelts to be safe. You look both ways to cross the street. Uh, you know, if someone offers you candy, you don't go with them. You know, all these things that we do to safeguard our children, but then we don't safeguard them in terms of sex. And I think that we're doing them a big disservice by not doing that. We do have um, a not helpful habit of providing non-biological names for private body parts. So you're gonna hear all sorts of, um, people sometimes refer to them as cute, but I just think, find them very complicating names um, for body parts. So we've had things like a child saying, um, you know, a vagina is a cookie, or 
other things like that, which become very confusing. Um, in one instance, I had um, a child say that someone had eaten their cookie. Now, if you tell me that you, you know someone ate my cookie, I think you're talking about a chocolate chip or oatmeal cookie or something of that nature. And because the child does not have language, what that child was actually trying to explain was that oral sex had occurred but they didn't know that this is called a vagina or, you know, so when you say, so, you know, someone ate my cookie, that's the best they could do in explaining that. So just the importance of realizing, let's call our body parts what they are called biologically or medically, so that there's absolutely no room for confusion. We also need to move away from thinking that sex is uh, a big talk, or the birds and the bees, or once my child starts dating, then I'll talk to them about sex. I think that um, it needs to be lots of little talks and very open communication. I think we should be striving to to dialogue with our children constantly about little things and big things. Uh, being the type of parents that can hear a child rant about f Facebook fight and you know or whatever their issue is that they're having at, at school or with their friends and not just dismiss them because if if we don't open our ears or if we don't listen to them when they come to us for the little things, then they're not going to come to us for the big things. As a community, I think that we all need to be educated and we all need to come to terms with the fact that it is happening on this island. I think that after the education, we need to be willing to report as individuals. We need to be an advocate for those children. We need to be the voice for those children and protect them. I think as we, as we um, kind of sit by and not push for maybe policies to be um, push, put forward, uh, maybe you know, not even saying anything to our legislators or you know, not even advocating for, for um, certain things to be done in schools, it's not a prevalent issue as, let's say for example, um, you know, uh, burglary or something like that that makes the headlines all the time. So it becomes something that people put out of their minds. Be willing to listen to them, create that bond with your child so if anything ever happens, they feel very comfortable with coming to you about the issue, about being sexually abused. You don't know when they're gonna hear about sex for the first time. Uh, it, it may be very, very young and a lot of little kids have older siblings and they talk to them about it. And so I think educating and, and empowering our children from a young age is important. Also, putting on, the, unfortunately, a child sexual abuse lens over everything your child is involved in. Uh, seeing how many one-to-one -one, uh, interactions they have. So um, even looking at, is it just one bus driver? Or is there somebody else as well there to, to assist? Um, can I pop into my child's school and or after school activity. I know schools have more stringent guidelines, um, but if it's an after school activity, can I pop in un you know, unannounced? Uh, is there uh, some sort of clear glass or something that I can see my child or, or a supervisor, anyone can see my children without having to go into the room? Another thing you can look at is their, their language. Has their language changed? Um, are they talking about things that you know doesn't happen in your household? I think we need to be very aware with that. So again, the communication is very important. I think that if you have a young child, if you're bathing them, I think this is it's important to just kind of know if, if there's scars or there are bruises, if your child is complaining about itching or hurting. I think that we need to really listen to those things. Uh, I think that also, we need to know who our child is hanging around. I think that it's very important for our for us to know if your child is going to a person's house, you know, what's what is that family like? What is that environment like in that family? And just be um, not overly anxious about it, but you have to have certain safety plans in place for your children. Sometimes uh, organizations can be all too eager to accept free volunteers and so they'll take anyone on and with the transient community that we have here in the Cayman Islands we have to be very careful because if we don't know where they're coming from or why they're here to begin with and uh, so we need to be looking at background checks also uh, not just taking a reference letter you know oh, they gave a reference letter. No, like calling wherever they're from, really investigating them, Google them, 
Facebook them, <laughs> uh, see what they're up to, you know, because I think it's important that uh, whoever's interacting with our children, we, we get to know who they are and, and be that parent that does ask a lot of questions, you know, even if you, oh, I don't want to be annoying. No, it's your child. Be, be annoying, be obnoxious. Sometimes you meet up with persons who literally feel that this cannot touch them. And I'm here to tell you that that's not so. It might not be happening in your home, might not be happening in the home of your sister, or might not be happening in the home of your friends, but your children are going to school with kids who are hurt. You're going to work with people who have this in their, in their um, history and who, because of it, are, are bitter or because of it are angry or difficult to work with. So it's not a door that we can shut and say it doesn't impact us. The people who are breaking into our homes, the people who are wanting to date our children, they are all possibly persons who've had this in their history. So we can't just say, you know, I'm 100% sure that my life is free of that because no one I know would do that. But yet we're interacting with these persons every day because they have to function. They have to work, they have to go to school, they have to go to the supermarket, they serve us in restaurants, they bump into us, you know, as we walk the streets. So it does impact us. And as a whole, um, financially it impacts us because the, the, the amount of money that is spent by someone who is desperately trying to, to feel better and to make themselves better is a burden that whether it's being paid by our um, national health insurance or it's being paid by private insurances, there is a financial cost to this. So the financial cost in, the, in that way through accessing health services and the financial cost when productivity is reduced because you have someone on staff who can't seem to get to work on time and you think it's because they're lazy or you know it takes them 10 hours to do what everyone else can do in five. It is costing us money-wise, but it's also costing us as a community. We need more education. We need it in the schools, although they're trying their best in the schools, but we need more time to discuss this. Um, you know, it's not always the best environment to talk about sexual abuse when you're doing it in a regular classroom situation. Uh, by sheer virtue of the fact that you've got 25 children sitting there with one member of staff, what needs, what is required is intimate conversation. Uh, what tends to happen is that when it's delivered to larger groups of children, it becomes academic. And I think the, the emotionality attached to it, which needs to be spoken about, I think that becomes diluted or non-existent in many cases when the delivery is with larger groups of children. So that's one thing for sure. I think the other thing is that um, more of this public education so that the perpetrators and the victims and the family members can all understand we are not putting up with this any longer in this country and we will expose it. This notion of the unspeakable evil, it's just something that doesn't make sense. I can't think of a single problem or social ill that is not made worse by silence. And silence is essentially the reason why we're in the situation that we are at in the first place. As adults, our fear of potential victimization, or the potential victimization that we will suffer if we stand up for a child, be it our own or another, is such that it keeps us from acting and it keeps us from giving a second thought to the actual suffering that children who are being sexually abused are going through quite possibly on a daily basis. It would just be for someone to take that responsibility and to just stand up and say, this is what needs to be done and for the focus to be on the welfare of the child. My fear is that many of them don't understand that this isn't okay. And my fear is also that many of the family members does not realize, do not realize that this is not okay. Now the reason why it, it seems as if it is not being brought to the forefront is because there's a lot of hush-hush. People don't want to talk about it. It's not something pleasant, it's not something pretty. And then 
oh, my uncle was involved with that because there's so much family in Cayman and it, because it is more rampant than people wish to admit, there's, it's connected to so many different people. So as a result, trying to hide shame and personal family embarrassment, people tend to try to cover it up or just flat out ignore that it exists. I'd like to speak to what the children have told me rather than give you my personal opinion, so forgive me for being anecdotal. Um, I've had children say to me that they don't see the point in reporting given the length of sentencing. They don't see the point in reporting given the lack of sentencing. They don't see the point in reporting given the fact that they're removed from the family home and the perpetrator remains there. So these are the three main reasons that children have said to me they seriously don't see the point. Because their life becomes their life becomes um, chaotic for that period of time after they've made the report. And for many of them, they believe that it remains that way. It's a subject that no one really wants to talk about. And I think by skirting around the issue and saying, yes, I give it my full support. Um, thank you, Red Cross, for doing what you're doing or other organization. I will now take my exit. I don't want anything to do with it. Um, doesn't help the situation. I think um, being an advocate, being um, in the forefront to say, look, um, you know, as men, we need to take a stand against this. We have children and we need to take care of the children of this island. Um, if we are truly going to be fathers, we need to step forward and be fathers not only to our children but to, to the community. Let us choose to do the right thing. Let us choose differently. Let us choose our children over our sense of comfort. And let us act when we are called upon to act. Mm -hmm.